This is day 35 of my six mark challenge for AQA GCSE Science. In the run up to the GCSE exams, each day from Monday to Saturday, I'm posting a new video with a six mark question so that you can practice how to answer these extended response questions and also see how you would have got on and how many marks you would have received. You can find a link in the description below to each week's questions and also you can access all of the previous videos via the playlist. Today's question comes from the rate and extent of chemical change topic, which is the first topic in AQA GCC Chemistry Paper 2. Now, although this question may look like an essay question, it's really not. Your ideas need to be presented in a logical order, but that doesn't mean that there are any marks at all for full sentences. So you can save yourself some time and make your examiner's life easier by giving your answer in the form of bullet points or even a numbered list, which is a really strong strategy when you're writing a method like you are here. It's also really important that you make sure you're answering the full question, which for a method question like this really means writing a method that will allow you to get the data you need to answer the question and, you know, answering the question. If you haven't done so already, give yourself six minutes now to answer this six mark question. This question is about one of the required practical activities for GCSE chemistry, but this required practical is really two separate investigations. You need to be able to describe how to calculate the rate using one method that involves collecting gas and a separate method that involves measuring turbidity. Now, in this question, we're given a very clear indication of which half of the practical this is about, because they've given us a diagram showing a gas syringe. But in some questions, they're not going to do that. So just to make it really, really clear to you, they've given you a chemical symbol equation and you can see here that there is a gas being produced. If I was looking for a question where I was going to write about turbidity, I would see a solid being produced. So the fact that I've got this hydrogen gas here clues me into the fact that I'm going to be collecting gas. Once you've established that this isn't an investigation looking at turbidity, the next thing I would do would be to concentrate on my variables. It's a really strong strategy whenever you're writing a method to begin by explicitly noting down what your independent, dependent and control variables are, because one of the most common ways that candidates lose marks in these kinds of questions is that they write the whole method for one version of the investigation and then they forget to say, now go back and do it again, changing the independent variable. Or they just assume that you're going to know that you need to write down the dependent variable each time and they forget to explicitly tell you to do that or they just don't mention any control variables at all. So in this investigation, the independent variable, the thing that we're changing each time is going to be the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. The dependent variable, which we're measuring to see what the impact of changing the independent variable is, is going to be the volume of gas that is being released per second. Now, it's really, really crucial that in any question where you're trying to calculate rate, you do explicitly mention that you're going to time the reaction. And that's not just chemical rate. It also comes up in your biology papers for rate of photosynthesis. If you haven't explicitly said somewhere that you're going to time it and you're going to measure the volume of gas per second or per 10 seconds or whatever it is, then you're not going to get the marks because without that timing, you cannot calculate a rate. Now, in terms of the control variables here, the first one is going to be the volume of the hydrochloric acid. Your teacher has probably said to you before that it's really important that when you mean volume, you say volume and you don't use the word amount. Now, without wishing to confuse things too much, there are some situations where you could get away with saying amount because that would also be true because amount means the number of moles. And if you're sitting higher tier, then you know what that means. But in this investigation, we are changing the amount because we are changing the concentration. So in this investigation, it would be absolutely wrong to say amount. And it's absolutely vital that you say volume. The second control variable that we're going to use is the mass of the magnesium that we're adding to the acid each time. You might also want to get into things about the type of magnesium, whether you're using a piece of ribbon or some um, powdered magnesium or things like that. But really, as long as we've got mass, we've kind of got ourselves covered here. Now, the other thing that we see students writing a lot of the time is that they're going to control the temperature of the reaction. Now, that is a really sensible thing to control. And if we wanted really perfect data, we would need to control it. But just be aware that doing everything at room temperature is not the same thing as controlling the temperature. If you're going to have temperature as a control variable, then you need to be explicitly saying that you're going to do like you do in the enzyme investigations in GCC biology and actually putting it in a water bath. So if you're not going to do that, then I would steer away from mentioning temperature at all. 
Now let's look at the method that you're going to write. Remember, the number one most important thing when you're writing your method is that it will give you valid data that allow you to answer the question. So although it might be OK to miss out a little thing here and a little thing there, if any of the steps that you've missed out in your method mean that at the end of the investigation, you wouldn't be able to answer the question, what is the impact of changing concentration on the rate of reaction? Then you're not going to get six or even five marks because you're going to be capped at a level two answer, which has a maximum of four marks. So think carefully about what the absolutely vital steps are. Obviously, in order for us to collect any data at all, the chemical reaction needs to take place. So somewhere in your method, you're going to need to describe how you would add the magnesium to the acid and then assemble things so that you can collect the gas. Before we get to that stage, though, we need to measure the acid and the magnesium. And as far as possible, we want to be naming the equipment that we use. I would start off by saying that I'll measure 10 centimetres cubed of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. Now, it's absolutely fine if you've said measure a set volume or measure the same volume every time. I just find that it saves time to name a volume. And there isn't one particular volume that it has to be. You're not going to lose marks if you've said five or 20, as long as you haven't said something completely ridiculous, like an entire swimming pool of acid. Likewise, it's OK if you've just said a particular concentration and not named a number, but it is going to save you time if you do that. And then, as I mentioned, as far as possible, we want to be naming the equipment. So here I'm going to say that I will measure that volume using a measuring cylinder. Next, I want to think about the mass of the magnesium. So I'm going to measure half a gram and I'm going to say that I do that using a balance. Again, the half gram is not important. If you've said 0.2 grams or one gram, that's absolutely fine, as long as you haven't suggested adding several kilos of magnesium to your acid. So then we add the magnesium to the acid and we replace the bung so that the gas syringe is now connected and we start the stop clock at the same time. It's really important that you mention that you need to write down how much gas has been released in a set amount of time. And again, the exact amount of time probably doesn't matter. 10 seconds is fine. 20 seconds is fine. We just need to make it really, really clear that we're timing and it's the same amount of time each time that we repeat the investigation. Then we're going to repeat all of the steps so far and we're going to use that data to calculate a mean. Remember, there's almost never a mark just for saying repeat the investigation. It always needs to be repeat and use that to calculate a mean. And the reason that we're doing this is to remove error in our data. Then I want to repeat everything I've done so far, but using a different concentration of acid. Or you could just say using hydrochloric acid that is 0.2 molar and 0.3 molar and 0.4 molar. Really, this investigation will give us valid data as long as we have two concentrations. So you don't need to have said a certain number of different concentrations in order to get all of the marks. Finally, I want to make it really clear to my examiner that I understand how I'm going to use this data and how I'm going to answer the question. So I'm going to include in there the calculation that rate is the volume divided by the time. But you could also talk about the fact that the reaction that produces the most gas per second is the one that has the highest rate. Don't forget, this question is going to be common between the foundation tier and the higher tier. So you don't actually need to have said everything that you know about concentration and rate in order to get all the marks. So it's beyond the scope of this question to start talking about why it is the increase in the concentration increases the rate. You don't need to be going into collision theory and talking about particles colliding more frequently in this answer. In order to achieve level three and therefore five or six marks on this question, your method must produce valid data. And so there are certain things that you have to have included in your answer. Otherwise, you're going to be capped at four marks. We wouldn't be able to collect any data at all without the chemical reaction happening. So your answer must include an instruction that you add the magnesium to the acid. You must have included that you're going to measure the volume of gas being produced and that you've done so while timing. You must include that you need to repeat the investigation, changing the concentration of the acid. You need to have identified at least one control variable. And then you also need to have discussed how we can find out what the rate is based on the data that we've collected. So that could be either including the calculation in there, or it could be saying that if there's more gas being produced in the same amount of time, then that tells you that the rate is higher. Or actually, you could have also always looked for the same volume of gas and measured how long it took for it to be produced. And you could say that if it takes less time to produce the same volume of gas, 
that indicates that the mean rate of reaction is faster. That's it for today, but here's a sneak preview of tomorrow's question. Don't forget, you can find a link in the description below to all of this week's questions and also a playlist containing all of the videos in this series so far. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you back tomorrow for the next instalment of the AQA GCC Science 6 Mark Challenge. If you have found this video useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCC Science revision videos coming soon.